about a second or two of mourning, so it's <laughs> really good to turn out today. Uh, it's really a pleasure to welcome Jerry Power to this series. Jerry is an alumnus of this program. You can tell from his accent. <laughs> who spent many years with the BBC World Trust uh, and in that capacity of working, particularly with Sheila and others, worked with a great number of our students on research projects. And in his current role, he's just moving to become the managing director of Intermedia in London. We hope to continue a fruitful relationship that has, I think, been a great benefit to us and I hope to uh, the organizations that Jerry has worked with and has done really uh, impressive and uh, important work on applying communication theory and research to really important problems in many parts of the world. And we will be speaking today on, it's probably up here and you can read it. <laughs> Let me just note that we have set aside some time for Jerry to meet and talk with students following this talk at 1.15, which will be in room 20, uh, 223B. Thank you, Larry. And um, it's, as always, a, a real honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, I've never been with quite so many people in this room before. Um, what I would like to do today, and I realize that um, we've got some time pressure, so I'm going to move fairly, fairly quickly, um, is essentially a work in progress. Um, and so I invite all of your comments, questions, criticisms. Um, perhaps at the end would be a more efficient way for us to do it. Uh, but if there's something that's just killing you to ask me, don't, 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 don't stop. Um, what I'd like to do first is talk a little bit about the role of access to information in what are known as the MDGs, or the Millennium Development Goals. We'll talk a little bit about that as, as we go through. Then advance based on those insights towards a very, at this stage, very kind of rough conceptual framework for understanding the relationship between access to information as a concept and the, and the Millennium Development Goals. And then finish on some methodological cons considerations in terms of qu questions, scale construction, um, et cetera. And I assume I've got about 40 minutes, sorry, is that right? Um, the organization that I'm currently working with is uh, called Intermedia. Uh, Intermedia, as some of you may know, is a not-for-profit 501c3 based in Washington. And its origins are uh, as the research department for the BBG, the Broadcasting Board of Governors. Um, that's the organization that oversees the US international broadcasters. The Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, Radio Free Asia, Radio Marti, Al Hura. And Intermedia's role since the mid-90s has been to provide the research that documents the extent of listenership and viewership of all of those broadcasters. Um, and conducts about 300 studies a year, probably about 60% survey research, and the remainder are qualitative, largely focus groups with some interview work as well. Um, working in about 60 countries a year, but in about 100 uh, countries in total. Um, over the last three years, largely because of its expertise and experience working in uh, developing countries, difficult environments, conflict areas, it has also attracted the attention of uh, the development sector and has a large Gates funded um, research initiative as, as well, which I will uh, talk to you a little bit about. What's not on this slide uh, is something that uh, Intermedia will um, be essentially rolling out over the next few months, and that's a capacity building initiative for researchers in the field. In other words, rather than a model of parachuting expatriate, and for those of you in this room, you would all constitute as expatriate uh, researchers flying into developing countries, doing the research and leaving again, the alternative model is to actually work with local people to build up the technical research capacity and expertise so that there is a, a leave behind beyond the data that one has gathered. Um, and that commitment is very much in the spirit of the work uh, that we were doing at the BBC World Service Trust. 
Um, as I said, a global reach of about 60 countries will give you a sense of the, uh, the geographic spread. Um, a, a, a very strong reputation um, in working with hard to reach populations, difficult to access populations, but largely because, again, these, these studies for the BBG have had to be nationally representative samples and to be able to substantiate that these broadcasters were being listened to by remote populations, marginalized populations, groups that were outside of, of, of in some cases, the political mainstream. The Development Focus Research Initiative um, at Intermedia is called Audiencescapes. And Audiencescapes was originally an Intermedia idea that there was a missed opportunity with all of the data that was being gathered around media, communication, information in developing countries, and not being shared with the development sector uh, more, more, more broadly. And so the Gates Foundation uh, were very um, interested in this and, and have funded the Audiencescapes um, initiative for the last three years. And it essentially constitutes a clearinghouse uh, for, for data that's gathered around media, communications, information in developing countries. And the data consists of primary data that Intermedia is commissioned to gather, some survey research, some qualitative work, uh, both with citizens and with policy makers, opinion leaders, stakeholders, um, but there is also um, an online data query tool where one can go in as a user and do one's own analysis of the data that's already gathered. Um, there is also a, a commitment to aggregating the data of other organizations. So, for example, we're in conversation with the Trust at the moment that has data all over Africa, all over the Middle East, and all over Asia, and making that data available on the Audiencescapes website. So I would encourage those of you who have an interest in this area um, to, to, to check out the Audiencescapes research. I should also mention, um, and this is relevant to our, our, our conversation today, is that Intermedia will also be rolling out over the next few months a series of research offerings that are in this initial rollout as a set of essentially research solutions to what have been identified as common development problems. Uh, the access to information MDG tracker, which we'll be talking about today. Um, the second one, a research design that essentially would inform um, the, the, the stakeholders around upcoming elections in developing countries. So much of the work in developing countries around media and elections happens around the elections themselves. How do the media cover the election? How, which positions do they take? But from a citizen's perspective, in terms of an inclusive and a peaceful election, it's too late. And so the, the, the essence of the idea here is to create a research program 12, 18 months out to understand what do people know about the elections, what do they know about the issues, the policies, um, and to be as inclusive as possible. It's an influence audit which is partly designed to um, work with some of the public diplomacy um, sector, both in, 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 in the US and in Europe, to understand, you know, it's probably the most less logically complex of, of, of these offerings from a qualitative and quantitative perspective, ways of understanding forces that influence people's decision making in particular socio-cultural socio context. It's a cross-platform engagement index that essentially runs across all of these, uh, a disaster preparedness and response information toolkit which is essentially understanding the not only the media infrastructure but the information dissemination patterns in disaster prone areas so that humanitarian response agencies have the benefit of that insight prior to the disasters occurring. Um, and then the final one is a, what we're calling a sports event research planner. Across 17 of the UN agencies, they have a sports agenda. It's one of their strategic priorities to use sports as a way of advancing development objectives. But typically that happens at an interpersonal or group level rather than at a mass level. And so this is an attempt to understand the potential to leverage the media coverage of sports events to advance development objectives around soccer, around cricket, around football, um, because that, again, is, is, is a hugely understudied area. Very briefly, and I'm not going to take as much time as I did in the last week with this exercise, but I want you to take a moment to reflect on these four questions. The first question is thinking about a typical day 
list three pieces of information that help you make the decisions that are important to you on a daily basis. A typical day. You get up in the morning, what are the three things that you think I need to know to get through the day? Right? And think about where does that information come from? The third question is thinking about your life more generally. What are the three pieces of information that help you make decisions that are important to your life in general? And where do those, where does that information come from? You can write it down if you're so inclined, but I, mean, I don't want to take a lot of time in doing this. One of the difficulties we have answering these questions is that we end up saying things like the weather, the traffic, how am I going to get to work, what's the schedule like, right? Largely because there's a lot of certainty around us. We're kind of sure that we'll be a building there when we get to USC in the morning. <laughs> We're assuming, earthquakes aside, that there will be a freeway. A lot of what we have to do is predictable. There's not a lot of ambiguity. There's not, the things we have to be concerned about are rather limited. That's not true for a lot of people in the countries that we're working in. <clears throat> when they wake up in the morning, they've got to figure out, how am I going to eat today? Could I be killed today? Could my child be killed today? Will my child survive the day? They're a little bit more <coughs> serious. Right? The, things, the, the things they need to do to get through that day, and the things they need to get through their lives, are slightly different from the concerns <coughs> that we have. So this notion of information and the value of information, even on a very basic level, takes on a completely different connotation in, in contexts that are different from ours. Two photographs on the left are of a small town in rural Cambodia called Kampong Cham. And back in 2003, as part of a formative research project, I was there with some of the research team in Kampong Cham and Batambang and Kampong Pot and all these remote parts of Cambodia to try and understand what young people, and young we were defined as 15 to 24, knew about HIV and AIDS. We wanted to use that, that research to inform a baseline study and, and a much larger media intervention. And I was shocked. Every focus group we observed males, females, in all of these locations could list off every method of transmission and every method of prevention of HIV. And I said to the BBC, well, let's pack up and go home, because others have clearly done their work very, very well. And the, the organization that, that was most, most active on the ground at that time was PSI, Population Services International. They'd done an incredible job at educational efforts at the community level. And these kids knew it all. Now, the extent to which that was translating to behavior, mm -hmm. despite the knowledge and the attitude position they were at, is a different question. The fact is, they had the basic information that they needed to make more responsible decisions about their, their, their lives and their health. Less than a year later, I was in Tukuyu. Tukuyu, similar size conurbation on the borders, about 11 miles outside Dar es Salaam, on the borders of Tanzania and Zambia. <coughs> Similar objective, trying to understand what young people knew about HIV and AIDS. And it happened the way the sample was designed, it, it happened to be all female groups in Tukuyu. And it was heartbreaking <clears throat> in 2005 to hear these women not know anything about HIV. They'd heard of it, they, you know, they, they, the, the name was not unfamiliar to them, but what it was, or moments of transmission, or moments of prevention, completely anathema to them. They just had never heard of this before. And I was shocked. I mean, like, just the, the, the juxtaposition of the two experiences in a short period of time really spoke to the difference when people have some basic information to help them to make, make important decisions about their lives. And the issue in Tukuyu, as in Kampong Cham, is there's a very active media system in Tukuyu. There's local radio stations, there's an FM station, there's state television. Sorry, she I stop that into the screen. So it isn't as if there wasn't access to media or ICTs 
Sorry, I promise not to do it again. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just it for longer than yeah, 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 the longer than sorry, sorry, sorry. I can't. I have no control of my right hand. So it wasn't the case in Takuya that there wasn't a media system. But what this experience suggested to me was access to media is not an access to information. And access to information does not guarantee access to quality information. And those distinctions, if we're going to use information as a vehicle, or media as a platform to deliver information as a vehicle to reach to, to the Millennium Development Goals, those grandiose goals, then we need to understand the subtlety and nuance of all of those items. Okay. The, uh, the technology and the infrastructure in and of itself is not sufficient. Here's some data from intermediate uh, studies across 60 countries from 2003 to 2009 looking at the change in the use of media as a source of news and information during that period. The orange represents the increases, and the darker orange larger increases, the green decreases or, or larger decreases, and the white is no change. Now I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I want to draw your attention to two things. First of all, a huge increase in what's labeled here as SMS, but it's essentially mobile across all of the regions, more or less. But the predominance, the continuing predominance of radio in Africa. Okay. So again, it's just the, the bigger picture in terms of trends is yes, there's a huge increase in mobile, and in some regions there's an increase in television. But the dominance of radio in Africa prevails. Okay. So to think about these media as separate channels is not necessarily the most strategic way to do that. Just for those of you who are not familiar with the Millennium Development Goals, there are um, eight. And for each of these goals, there's a series of sub-goals. And this reference on top is to a piece that was published in The Lancet just last week um, by uh, Jeff Wagg, who's the director of the London Develop International Development Centre, which is a consortium of the Bloomsbury Colleges. And it's, a, it's essentially an attempt to approach development from an interdisciplinary perspective. So they've got the Institute of Education, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, uh, Birkbeck, um, University, the, the Veterinary School, the Pharmacy School. So thinking about development issues in, in an interdisciplinary way. The WAG article is essentially a review of the progress on the goals. Because this week in New York, the UN is reviewing it is an, an MDG summit, and they're essentially reviewing the progress on the goals. In most cases, the goals have not been met, and they're not likely to be met. And there's been some progress in some areas, but very little. From our perspective, I thought it was remarkable that only one of the sub-goals spoke to the importance of information, and that is 6.3, around a, a target that 16 to 24 year old, 15 to 24 year olds would have knowledge around HIV and AIDS. That's not the case for the maternal and child health statistics, around which 8 million kids die every year from diarrhea, acute respiratory infection, and malaria. All very, very preventable, somewhat based on information and then certain services. In lots of cases, the services are available, but the information is not. Here's the data, um, and I should qualify a lot of the, the, the data I'm presenting. It's kind, of a, it's kind of a retrospective analysis. These studies from AudienceScapes were not designed to answer the kinds of questions that we're now asking of them. So that you'll see there, in some cases, it's a, it's a bit of a mix and match. But here are the data from Kenya, Ghana, and Zambia on, on <coughs> that people have received information on these topics in the last 12 months. And you see, one in four people in those three countries have not received any information on maternal and infant health. So the diarrhea, the acute respiratory infection, the malaria. And when you look, the, the, the slide that's more interesting is when you break those figures down for urban and rural, those percentages shoot up for the rural subsamples, not surprisingly. But what's significant about that is that in most of these countries, and certainly in these three countries, the vast majority of people live in rural areas. 
60, 70, 80 percent of the population. So the absolute numbers of these higher percentages is even more significant. What we did not have was the corresponding data on people's acting on this information. Okay? What we did have was the data on people's access to formal financial services and informal financial services. And here's what that looks like. This was a pretty neatly built slide, but it obviously didn't build here. So what you have here is the information people have received on formal financial services in the last 12 months, and they're acting on that, or use of formal financial services. Some of you may know that there is a huge um, initiative, particularly across Africa, to use mobile platforms for, for, for financial services. Um, so that there's a way of working around the banks, and actually some of the data from Kenya suggests that 40% have used their mobile phones to either send or receive money in the last 12 months. So bypassing a lot of the formal financial institutions. What's significant here, I think, is the discrepancy between the rural uneducated women and the urban educated men. And I would, I would argue that if you looked at the health data, you see a similar discrepancy. Again, keep in mind that the vast majority of the people are living in rural areas, and the vast majority of people living in rural areas are not literate. So the significance of that proportion of the population is even greater. Um, the picture changes slightly when we look at informal financial services. It's a little bit more clustered. And actually women are much more dominant here than the men are. But you still are not moving over into the area of actually acting on the information. OK, what did the distribution look like across those four subgroups? And this is from Ghana. Um, the green bar is people who have access to one media platform only. Uh, the silver bar here, access to two. The red is to three. And the final one here is four or more. <coughs> What's significant here is the proportions of both rural uneducated men and rural uneducated women who have access to only one media platform. And that media platform is not mobile. 95% well, 92% of them here is radio, and for the men, 95% is radio. So Again, we're seeing radio dominating, particularly among those people who have only access to one media platform. Okay, now, back to our MDGs. Two reports published by UNESCO back in January of this year, the Global Monitoring Report, Education for All 2010, and Reaching the Marginalized, reported that less than 50% of school-aged children in developing countries attend secondary school. 72 million children are still out of school, and if the trends continue to 2015, which is the target year for the MD, um, MDGs to be achieved, there will be 50 million kids out of school. I think that's a shocking statistic, and under the current circumstances and conditions, unlikely to be achieved if we think about education in a traditional way. If we think about the objective being putting kids in classrooms or traditional classrooms with a teacher, it's rather problematic. At the same time, you've got this other trend in the <coughs> other direction. And these statistics are mostly from the ITU from 2009, where the adoption of mobile has been phenomenal. Again, largely in these bottom billion countries where the educational statistics are going down and the mobile statistics are going up in the opposite direction. So what happens when you look at the mobile statistics? Well, first of all, no surprise to those of you who are familiar with the mobile uh, patterns in, in Africa, 91% of those in, in Kenya have used a mobile in the last year and 88% in Ghana. What I think is shocking is that 36% of those have been using their mobile to listen to the radio. <laughs> Right? And 30% here listens to the radio. And those numbers are going up. They're actually slightly skewed differently than I would have expected for the urban rural. But nevertheless, speaking to, again, I think, the importance of not separating mobile from radio, but actually thinking more in terms of convergence. 
Okay. A few quick slides. What are the challenges in the sector in terms of relating interventions, actions, and media development and these development outcomes? First of all, there's huge doubt in the sector. There's huge doubt in the donor community and a lot of the, the players and stakeholders that media has any effect. Uh, there's a lot of inconsistency in what people's expectations are of the media in the development context. Some people are looking for very different things than others. There's a lot of fragmentation in terms of the donor community, and some of that is socio-political. There is a sense in which the US donor community only want to fund what are typically called independent media, but by independent, read commercial or non-state. Whereas the European donors are much more committed to helping state media along. So there's a real disconnect there um, in terms of the approach. There's a huge lack of expertise in terms of research. So even if the intervention has been successful, the research is not robust or rigorous enough to capture it. Right? So it's okay. you've, got, you've got to have both in order to be able to, to make the argument. Layered across this are all these technical technological changes. It was complex as it was, but now you've layered this new platform in terms of mobile across traditional media, making the uh, situation much more difficult. Okay, just to give you an example, some of the stakeholders are interested in regulatory issues, others are interested in political participation, others are interested in health and um, kind of D4D types of initiatives. Very, very different paradigms and very, very different sets of assumptions. So, big question, what is the conceptual framework or paradigm that we're operating with? So much of the work has been so practice-based and so kind of pragmatic interventions and actually driven by lots of practitioners that, that it, we've lost that conceptual position of actually what, what, what the underlying assumptions are. Are we interested in the impact of our work on the media system in these countries? Or are we interested in the impact of the media system on the citizens? Or is it both? There's a lot of confusion around that. So, the context in which we're developing this access to information, MDG tracker, drawing on a number of different sources, I'm going to go through this very quickly. Um, there's a very, very, for those of you who are interested, you should definitely explore it, very large scale uh, project uh, called Tuaweza, funded to the tune of about $65 million um, in East Africa, Tanzania, Uganda, and Kenya, <clears throat> looking at the relationship between media access to information, agency, and service delivery around health, education, and water. They're the three topics. It's got a very, very strong research component. There's a lot of academic involvement in it. And a lot of, in, a, in other words, a lot of, there's a lot of conceptual thinking behind the project, and I think is a, you know, an important player. And they have a specific focus on access to information, although they're not defining it the way we are. Uh, the metamorphosis work, Sandra's work, is also very relevant here, particularly in terms of taking that kind of communication ecology approach, not thinking about media per se, but thinking about information resources more generally. Um, Bella Modi's paper at ICA this year spoke to the importance of refocusing on state media in developing countries, largely because that's all most people have. When we looked at the 40 and 35% of rural uneducated people, they're not listening to, to, they're not using the internet, they're not listening to, to commercial radio, <coughs> they're not watching television, they're listening to state radio. Um, the lands, the, in terms of the media landscape work, the African Media Development Initiative work, the audience gates work, and really interestingly, um, Joy et al's piece in the journal last year has gotten a lot of resonance in the sector because it's documenting the relationship between exposure to content knowledge and attitude change, but the significance of self-efficacy and interpersonal communication or word of mouth in bringing about behavior change. <coughs> and it's that sophisticated, complex analysis that gives a lot of um, kind of credence to the, to the importance of bringing those two, two together, the word of mouth and the, and, the, and the mass media. Okay, so what are we talking about here? We're talking about the basic relationship is between uh, some media development uh, activities, what we're referring to at Intermedia now is ICM, it's Information Communication Media Resources rather than media, and a whole range of, kind of traditional activities, but some less traditional, in terms of understanding how to work with media in developing countries in a way that will, will have an impact on a range of development indicators. 
And we're arguing that one of the, the catalyst for this is understanding in much more detail this access to information. Um, and what we're arguing is that it's, it's multidimensional um, across access to the platform, exposure to the content, an evaluation or an engagement with the content, <laughs> the nature of the content itself, and ideally the self-reported response. Right? That's slightly problematic, and we'll get to that in, in, in a second. So an argument that what's connecting these media development interventions with some development outcomes is partly responded to, at least at the individual level, and that's important here because we're only focusing on the individual level, is a much more complex way of capturing what that access to information actually is. So access to media here does not guarantee access to information, or access to information does not guarantee access to quality information. So there's our definition. It's a composite measure of, of, of all of those five indicators in terms of people's relationship with those um, information communication media resources. Access. And access in developing countries has to be, has to kind of incorporate a number of different measures. Ownership versus access. Because often, certain people in the household will, will, will own and control access to, to the media platform. So yes, there's a radio in my house, but I never get to hear it. Or there's a mobile in our house, but I never get to use it. Um, whether it's used in, per, in a personal space or accessed in a personal space versus a public space is hugely important. And also restrictions can be in terms of time, electricity, and the signal. Yes, certain radio station reaches a certain area, but the signal doesn't work, so people can't receive it. So it's, it's, it's actually confirming all of that in the level of detail that, that it requires. In terms of exposure, frequency, time intervals, recently, excuse me, recency, indexing, recall, and format specific. What are you talking about there? Is actually, if we want to attribute these development outcomes to exposure to the content, we need to understand in great detail what the essence of that exposure is across, across time, linearly, and also in terms of, 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 of the depth. Um, evaluation. Really interesting. We, we did some work in Afghanistan a number of years ago around women's programming. And we wanted to understand in a very tactical sense what, how we would produce content that was a, a gender empowerment project, but how we would produce content that would resonate with women. And it was so fascinating to hear what women said, is that they would, when they would not believe another woman, even if it was qualified that she was an expert and had formal qualifications, unless they understood what her husband thought about her speaking on the radio. Right? So that's the legitimizing introduction for the woman, for what she has to say to have some credibility. And it's that kind of understanding the nuance and the subtlety of how people are connecting with the content, often in a very culturally specific way, c can be, again, the vehicle or the catalyst that, that uh, gets you in. Very common, and you will see, those of you who are familiar with the uh, media uh, development indices, the Transparency Corruption ind Index, the, um, the IREX Index, the MSI, uh, the Afro Media Barometer is this generic reference to media. The media this, the media that, the media. It's not subtle enough to capture how there's such a variation across those different media platforms and those formats. Um, another piece that we did, uh, it was a very, very detailed content analysis of uh, the coverage of the upcoming elections about three years ago in Yemen. We did a very detailed content analysis across state radio, television, and print, state-owned newspapers, and also on websites. And the most, we, we, we were able to track a lot of interesting findings over the six-month period, because we repeated the study six months later. But the most surprising thing to me was the variation within state media, that state radio, state television, state print do not cover the same topics in the same way. Okay, and so labeling them in that very generic way loses a lot of the important differences between them, and also understanding which media are likely or are the most um, opportunistic to work with. So the detail there is, is important as well. Okay, ideally what you want, well, what we have always wanted in these studies is people self-reporting that they have made decisions as a result of something they heard on that radio program. They actually, they're making the connection themselves. 
But I believe, and it was, uh, I gave a presentation, at the, at the, a similar presentation to this at the World Bank this last week, and they were all there scratching their heads thinking, how do we how do, we do the research on this? And it, it, it's, it amazes me that so much money is poured into the service delivery, but no effort that at the point of service delivery to gather some very simple data. Where did you hear about this? Where did you know about this? How much do you understand about it? Because that powerful data is then feed back um, into the intervention itself, which is very much the spirit of the Tuawesa project. It's linking the service delivery back into the access to information vehicles. Okay, my last slide. Um, first of all, to consider um, access to information as a catalyst uh, to the achieve achievement of these MDGs, to somehow assume that a, a, a family in rural Somalia is going to know and understand the benefits of sending their daughter to school without the information about those benefits is rather naive. You can build the schools, but if you don't understand, and we've substantiated this in the research as well, that the obstacles to those parents sending their daughter to school, not the physical obstacles themselves, it's the lack of understanding and the information um, that many of them have. The importance of developing a multi-item uh, index for capturing this access to information. That there's a focus on the content rather than just the format or the platform. Um, if integrating and measuring that word of mouth is crucial in all of this, particularly with a lot of the social media, because of the propensity and ability to be able to share that information very, very quickly is, is hugely optimized. Um, and thinking very seriously about these, these convergence patterns. Not, and not thinking about mobile and radio as separate, but how do you leverage radio on a mobile platform, radio content on a mobile platform for these development objectives. Um, recognizing, as, as many interventions do not, the diversity of users. Not treating your urban educated male the same in terms of content that one would one's rural uneducated female. Um, integrating data gathering at the, at the service delivery point, but also, Moving away from this approach to research as if it's something that's separate from and an add-on to the intervention, but rather integrating it into the, the work itself. Thank you. Considering this last one, because quality of content is very difficult to evaluate, just considering the first one, uh, statistics that you showed with radio and mobile phones basically tell us that uh, mobile phones are becoming more and more universal, and so the divide of access to information is being closed, as what many argue. However, now if you look on just on this first step, if you look on the on the information transmitted, mobile phone transmits like 50 kilobits per second. Right, 30 to 20, 25 for voice and 25 for SMS. Um, a radio <coughs> transmit like 700 kilobits per second. And the rich people of this world, information rich in Korea and Japan, everyone has like 100,000 kilobits per second available already. So this, this divide that is between mobile phones and fiber optics, 50 to 100,000, is actually is the biggest divide we've ever seen in history. The income divide is what? 1 to 50,000 per year. Here we have 50 to 100,000 per second. So it's actually this divide which is newly increasing now is much wider than every divide we have ever seen. So my question is basically, we're seeing these statistics. Isn't it a little bit, isn't the tale a little bit, um, let's say that, well, now everybody has mobile phones. The question is kind of like now they have the equal access to information. Isn't it a little bit deceptive? Um, if, if you took that from what I said, that certainly wasn't intended. Um, the, the, the spirit of, of, of presenting the data was to, to, to acknowledge the fact that mobile is prevalent in a lot of countries, even at a very, very basic level. Um, but, but not to separate that from the access to, that people have to other media and to think about the way in which they would work together. 
And I agree with you in terms of the divide, particularly in terms of socioeconomic differences, which is why you see some of that reflected with the urban versus rural data. Um, so, and I'm not in disagreement with, 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 with that point, but I, I guess the, the, the divide argument for me distracts attention away from how in the context of rural poor audiences, one is going to tackle those very basic problems. Um, and so, you, you, it, I think so much attention has been paid on, 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 the, on the differences in the technology adoption itself and the differential access that people have to it. But in the meantime, you've got 50 million kids out of school in five years. You, in a sense, you've got to work with what you have um, in terms of, of, of understanding what the, what, what the opportunities are. Um, and, I, and I don't think the argument around the, the, the divide, even though I, and you're, I agree with you that the, the that divide is increasing, advances that, 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 um, that argument. Um, a lot of the uh, information uh, access framing is around supply. Um, and I'm just curious about your perspective about how this connects a little to demand. So in the sense that um, you know, communities were asked, what are your information needs? Uh, and instead of the funding agencies kind of pushing, we think you need to know this about health. We think you need to know this about education. Yeah. Communities where, where you would go into these communities and ask, what information do you need to make the decisions that you care about? Yeah. Is this something you look at when, when you're trying to assess, are they getting the information they desire? Um, and, and it kind of tying this back to the idea of kind of parachuting people in versus yeah. letting communities prioritize where they want to come from. Yeah, the, the closest example I can respond to on that one, Ben, is a piece of work we did at the Trust very recently. It's on a governance project, Sierra Leone, Angola, and Tanzania. Um, I felt, and we felt very strongly, that we really don't understand what the governance issues are in these communities. And for us to come in with our baseline study and our scales isn't going to quite be resonate with, with people. And so the way we approached it was, within the qualitative formative work, was asking people to take photographs. It wasn't quite framed in this language, but the essence of it was examples of manifestations of bad governance. So we got 3,000 photographs of food prices, potholes, people, you know, two people in a hospital bed, pollution, all sorts of, you know, school classrooms with, you know, with the buildings falling down, lots of really rich data that then helped us understand what people cared of, lots of four-wheel drives with wealthy NGO people driving around in them, you know, lots of <laughs> issues that really were at the heart of what people were concerned about. And that was very useful then in framing the questions in the quant. And so that's, as close as we've gotten to, do I think what you, with the spirit of what you're saying? Thanks. Well, I was intrigued by your comment about the importance of different media uh, um, working together to, to pass on a message. And uh, the example you gave was listening to radio on a cell phone. I'm wondering what else you've run into and, and how do you study this? Um, well, the other, the other work that I was familiar with, again, just before leaving the trust, which is all very recent, so sorry if I'm not drawing on more examples, um, was using the mobile platforms to download English language lessons that were prompted by a television drama. Um, and so there was a cost to downloading the English language lessons that were associated with the drama, but the cost was at an incredibly low pr price point that was made possible by a very unique collaboration between all of the network, the mobile network providers in Bangladesh in order to make this happen. So the cost of the download was less than a price of a cup of tea. It was just minimal. Um, and I thought that was a, it, you know, it, it's a little bit more demand focused and there is a cost involved, um, but it didn't have, it was, it was, it, it, did, it, it was a, the, the, the television platform was used to prompt the download as a kind of a promotional vehicle rather than it being purely a convergence example. Um, there is a very interesting project you're probably aware of um, being funded by the IDRC through Carleton University uh, looking at radio convergence uh, examples in Africa. Um, they've got about 18 funded projects that are all being led uh, by, uh, by African researchers 
Um, and so I'm, I'm familiar with some of the examples in there, but not all of them. Corolla. <laughs> yes. uh, you had mentioned that you gave a presentation at the World Bank uh, last week or, or earlier this week um, on uh, this question and how you were struck by the absence of information in the Millennium Development Goals. Is there any indication that short of killing off the million, Millennium Development Goals, which seems to be where the general public rhetoric is heading, that there is an effort to reform them, that perhaps modify them and include the information? It's a good question. I was, I was very reassured by three of the people there, one of the senior governance advisor for the bank in Asia, the mm -hmm. person leading the innovations team and somebody else on the demand team, mm -hmm. that I think it's really interesting. If you don't call it media, people are a lot less resistance, resistant. Mm -hmm. If you frame the importance of information in the context of governance or health, then it's more easily embraced. There is this real paranoia of media and media development, per se. But if you talk about it in terms of its value and currency within more mainstream development themes, then people are much more comfortable with it. And, and you know, there was as many people at the presentation of the bank because they were all thinking, OK, I, I, I get the connection. We're not talking about media here, we're talking about information that's connected directly into the MDGs. So I think there's, there's still an appetite for that, but, it's, but, it's, a, but it's, it's, a, it's an argument that needs to be made very, very strongly, and I, I don't think it's on the MDG agenda <coughs> this week at all. Nick. Jerry, um, based on what you now know, what would you advise people who are uh, public diplomas and professionals to do? Because you know, some, of the, some of the audience are students working in public diplomacy. One of the things that I'm, I'm seeing in those statistics is that this really is a powerful critique of the claims made both by the BBC World Service and by Voice of America, that all the fantastic work they were doing in Africa to make sure all the Africans knew about AIDS. And, um, and this is a, a, a powerful um, critique of those claims. Uh, <laughs> You're putting me on the spot here. <laughs> <laughs> what, would you, what would you suggest that they should, uh, that professional public diplomats should be, uh, should be, should be doing? Where should, or, or maybe, maybe even more pointed, where should legislators be looking to send the resources? You're throwing down the gauntlet. Okay. <laughs> I, th I, 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 I think there's three scenarios. I think there's a, there's the scenario in Burma and North Korea where, where there are very few alternative sources of information or news or insight that people have access to. Right. And I would never advocate that Voice of America or the BBC World Service or others would abandon those countries right. because there's a huge, there's a desperate need and a, a very clearly well articulated need in those countries by very poor people for that information and that lifeline for many of them of a, of a source of information from outside the country. Um, I, the second scenario is I think in countries that are very media rich in terms of television, radio, internet, mobile, where as soon as something happens in the US, everybody in Pakistan knows. And that's again largely urban populations. So I think that's, that's the second scenario where the, where the access to information particularly among certain populations, and they, they, depending on your public diplomacy strategy, they will, they will shift. And, and so I think, you think, well, what's Voice of America or the BBC going to add to this? People have so many other sources of information that in and of themselves vary in terms of their political perspective that you're not sure, it's not clear what the Voice of America and or BBC World Service or Deutsche Welle are adding to the mix. But then I think there's other countries that are we're perfectly stable, got perfectly legitimate, well-functioning media systems. In some, in some cases, one could argue, more well-functioning than the US or the UK. And so why are we there? Why are we spending US taxpayers' money or British taxpayers' money on these broadcasters in countries where they're not serving that old kind of post-colonial um, um, duty to those populations? So I think it's, there is a time, there is, there is a moment now, I think, to kind of review 
country by country, language service by language service, exactly what, what, what the return on investment is. And it's a huge, it's a huge question for the Foreign Office and for the State Department um, and for the BBG. Why are we spending so much on this? We're, what, 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 what bang are we getting for our buck? Isn't there a scenario that comes out of what you've been addressing, and that is that the voice of the merit of America and BBC World Service should be research driven. We'll get to the well, yes, Sandra. That, that, that they would they would say they are. They would say that the huge amount of money they're pouring into it, because they've always only been interested in reach, right? That's the currency at the Foreign Office and with the State Department, how many people are listening. Mm -hmm. But I think they're recognizing now, this is my last point, about integrating the research into the work itself. Right. Formatively, why are you doing this in the first place? How well are you doing it? And are there measures, important measures, beyond reach figures that you need to be interested right. in? And segment, realizing that, again, the point about <coughs> rural and educated women and urban rural men, they're very different. And, and, the, and the context for inf information for them is very, very different. And, but but it's, it, has, it has appeared to me to be very much a one-size-fits-all. You're a, a house a woman in northern Nigeria, and you're treated the same as a Christian man living in Lagos. That, that it's all, it's, it's, it will all resonate with you in the same way. And in that way, it is very kind of cookie-cutter. But that customized strategy also holds for Los Angeles. Yes. Jerry, may I ask a question? Thank you. Thanks for hiding back here. Um, I was wondering to what extent, if any, you're considering metrics that look at uh, media and information production by the consumers, sort of conceptualizing them as prosumers, and whether and how that might impact their ownership of the information they're able now to access and uh, play a role in behavior change and attainment of these Millennium Development Goals? That's a very good question. Um, not as I presented it here, but it was very interesting. There is a group at the World Bank, the InfoDev group, which you may be familiar with, mm -hmm. and they're very committed to working with the communities that they're trying to serve in developing the content that they put out on various platforms. Um, I think I mean, my approach to the trust was always that those more participatory approaches, those kind of bottom-up, grassroots approaches, are excellent, but they're very, very expensive and very time-consuming, and not always scalable, because what works with one community in rural Angola will not work with another community, and so it's 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 a resource budgeting judgment rather than a, a kind of a, 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 an approach to the work itself. Uh, Wally. A similar uh, question regarding the word of mouth integration with uh, uh, media information, since that resonates, I think, with a lot of previous research. Uh, what do we know about uh, what works there, and how does that, uh, or should that be affecting the uh, media organizations? Um, I can answer that in a somewhat limited way, but my colleagues who've been doing the BBG work at Intermedia for the last 15 years all say that word of mouth is so powerful in all of the countries that, world, that Voice of America and others are, are operating in. Um, and yet, it's not part of their strategy. It's not part of how information is designed to be shared with others or to, or to, or, or to be disseminated on um, in other ways. Um, the audience-scapes data which is much more recent and much more focused on, on the mobile sector, certainly speaks to the opportunities to, to share that information, particularly when, and they've only started to gather this, is, is, is named platforms. So talking about Facebook and Twitter and other platforms in, in, in Africa specifically, where people are gathering information and then sharing it elsewhere. Um, I thought one of the other observations that's, that's relevant here was <clears throat> they're, they're coming up against this increasing difficulty that people no longer define news in the same way, news and information. And so they're saying, no, we don't consume. No, we do consume news. So what's the news? Well, I shared news with my friends on Facebook, but it's all celebrity gossip. That's, that's now be the shifting definition of what's news, because th that's a lot of the content that's on the mainstream. And that's what people are picking up 
and assuming it's news in another context. Which, so the sharing is happening, but not, not with information that we would like them to be sharing. We would expect it to be different in the real community. If you talked about the Facebook, would probably would be much less of that. Yeah, the data they were speaking to specifically was Indonesia and Malaysia. I noticed you are not looking at all at print media, so I wanted to ask um, why are you focusing on the four other types of media and not print media too? That's a pretty good question. Um, It's a good, very good question. I, the only thing I can say is that in most of the, with most of the population that we were working with with these samples for the audience scapes data, I'm sure they gathered information on print, uh, but it was never very significant. That's often because of the literacy levels. Um, and, the, and print is never assumed outside of urban centers to be a, a, a meaningful vehicle, particularly in Africa, which is where I'm much more familiar with. Um, but it's probably worth revisiting. I have neglected it. There's no doubt about that. Actually, at the same time, we're told that, that some of these parts of the world are the places where print is increasing. In parts of India and Asia, I mean, that actually newspapers are multiplying and circulation is going up. Small, small yes, it's not the, yes, it's, it's the numbers of, of, I know the India example. There's lots of new, new publications, um, but not necessarily increased readership overall. Uh, but not in Africa. I haven't seen. Yeah, yeah. Um, in terms of user-generated content, which is really the you're talking about Facebook, and you talk about involving the um, the users and in, in the information, and at the extreme you have user-generated content where people produce this stuff on their own. And I was struck by your question about what is most important to you when you turn to you know, uh, what, what you turn to to answer those questions. And, I have to admit, I myself uh, answered letter and traffic and was very embarrassed afterwards. <laughs> but in, in these developing countries, it got me thinking, um, we have the same problem with social media. The things that people talk about on Twitter and Facebook largely are, are kind of trivial. Um, do you have any sense that uh, in, in these countries you're looking at, people want to talk about things that are really more important, that the, 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 the fundamental nature of user-generated content would be different in some way? Uh, <clears throat> Again, the, one specific example that I'm familiar with was some work we were doing in Iran, mm -hmm. uh, where we were specifically focusing on the Persian blogosphere and the likelihood that people would talk about certain topics online that they wouldn't talk about in person. Mm -hmm. But that was largely because a lot of people inside Iran who were blogging were blogging with people at the Iranian, the Persian diaspora. And so it was. It, it was. It shifted the the frames of reference, um, but often, interestingly, were not about politics with a big P, but politics with a small P. So skirting around the issues around freedom of expression, um, and and the state of the minority groups, rather than about the president and the elections specifically. Um, so yes, I, I think there's some evidence of it there. And I, again, I'm not as familiar with, with that specific question in context of Africa. I have a, also a question about the user-generated media, and I don't know whether, they, I suspect the data you're gathering wouldn't inform this, the question of whether people are concerned about surveillance. Because one of the things about the, this new possibility of you know, sort of horizontal <coughs> communication is that it is also open to a kind of surveillance that isn't necessarily the case in conversation. Yeah. And, yeah. and in many of the cases you're interested in probably going on. Yeah, and the only thing I could say to that is it, it, in speaking with a lot of uh, new research, new media research groups in, in the UK, is there is this shift to a methodology which they refer to as listening, which is listening, just observing. Mm -hmm. And I, there's, that gets a little dangerous in terms of do people know you're listening? Have you, have you, you know, is there, mm -hmm. and do people understand, even though it's a public forum, that what you've said may be used in other ways? So I think it's it's problematic, and I'm not comfortable with the listening approach per se. Um, so I, again, I think it's it's uncharted territory, but could could potentially be very dangerous yeah. because it because it plays against the political openness, particularly in countries where where that data is gathered very 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 strategically. <coughs>
for other purposes. I mean, we've learned in this country, so there's a lot of discussion about the fact that people post on <coughs> Facebook without thinking about who, who might be reading it and That's right. for how long. And I can't imagine, I mean, the Iran, you, you mentioned so many cases where this has been, yeah. uh, has been very relevant. So it adds a, a component to the, you know, sort of how the end users are engaging with it that yeah. really have been there before. Yeah, I mean, it's the Iran case, that we, there, were, there were situations where some of the bloggers, uh, families, and they themselves were approached by the authorities because of what they had been blogging on. Mm -hmm. So but that's, that's to be expected. They knew that. I mean, they, were, they understood the risk they were taking, right. uh, but nothing more serious than that. Mm -hmm. Last question. Uh, last question. Yeah. Martin. Martin. Um, Jerry, you moved from the BBC World Service Trust to uh, into media, so you bring a lot of your experience and, and, and your knowledge into, into media. And I was just wondering, uh, what would you see as your main challenge, your main new, uh, um, let's say, focus in your new position uh, to contribute to the new organization or to into media? I mean, what, what ticks your heart? Thank you for the question. Um, I, th I think decentralization. I don't think Intermedia wants a big, bigger office in Washington or a bigger office in London. I think what we want is an Intermedia in East Africa and an Intermedia in West Africa and an Intermedia in, in India so that, th so that the, these, these data are being gathered. There's an audience scape, a local audience scape where people are gathering the data themselves for dissemination themselves. And initially, that's likely to happen with a lot of technical input from Washington and from London, but eventually s scaling that off. Um, that to me would be, I would feel I had the job done there. Because I, I saw that at the Trust, I could see the value of the local knowledge on the research we were doing, that we benefited hugely, not only from the uh, just local, you know, local knowledge on the ground, but actually the way in which people thought about research design, about sampling, about question wording, about interpreting the results, there was that richness that I and others could not bring. And I, I think unless we invest in that, the, w the work we do will be always inherently limited, no matter how technically perfect it is. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's, it's building up an infrastructure on the ground that will do that in a sustainable manner. Good night, Anthony. Thank you. week's speaker just mark, is a joint event with the uh, Party Diplomacy Program. And the speaker will be Ronald D. Bear from um, the Monk Center for International Studies at the University of Toronto, speaking on the hidden geopolitics of cyberspace.